types of projects. And Theo Watson was one of my students, and when he graduated, he was using it for his projects and making all kinds of strange, strange stuff. And when he graduated, he joined, you know, joined forces, and then Arturo came, came after. And one of the things that, and there was this moment when I went to a festival, and this artist had come from Japan, and he, you know, he's like, I'm using open frameworks, and I had no idea. I and mean, I knew, you know, I knew our friends were using it, and I knew people, you know, who were using it. But I, to meet somebody, you know, from really far away, or like another time, I was at a festival, and this, this couple came up to me, and. And this guy was like, you know, I just want to say thank you for Open Frameworks. And and this the the his girlfriend was like, I hate you. Like my boyfriend spent all his, all his time in front of the computer, you know. So th those were the things that like in the early days when I when I started to realize that this thing, you know, was having a life of its own and and was spreading and going like really far. Mm. Yeah, of course, this is a really like a big challenge I think with a lot of open source projects, which is how do you grow and how do you like meet the really diverse needs of your users, which can be oftentimes really conflicting. Like beginners and intermediate advanced users want different things, want different features, want different materials. And how do you mix that? And you know, I think one of the things that about open frameworks has always been sort of geared with a sensibility of you know, things that we use that we would have wanted. Like if we could go back in time and talk to a younger version of ourselves and give them that tool, then you know that you know, that, that's the sort of thing, like we want, to, we want to build it for ourselves and, you know, and, and for people who are, you know, of similar mindset. Um, um, I think one of the reasons why it was very popular was the computer vision, you know, parts of OF, that, that, you know, it wasn't in the core, it was an add-on, but it like immediately made it possible to do, you know, fairly complex things without you know having to struggle through OpenCV where there wasn't at that time there wasn't a book and there wasn't great documentation and it wasn't you know that easy to get into so and so you know so much of it is about um, you know the the act of using it discovering what's broken trying to fix it and then you know trying to engineer pieces that are reusable and you know helpful for people mm -hmm. and, I, you know, I grew up in as an uh, you know just studied as a fine artist, and I worked in the print shop, and it's the same sort of energy and ethos that I saw in the print shop, which is like you can't you can't be a I mean it's really hard to be like a solo printmaker. You know, you can't own printing presses like giant, and it costs you know cost so much, and it's just so many things and materials and and so on. So you have a shop, and you're all working in the shop, and you're sharing the resources and something about the sort of communal art making process like we're working together individually but also together and there you know like you you might have a piece of paper and you're putting it in water another person is drawing out a piece of paper another person is inking a plate another person has a plate they're doing aqua tint with it and it's like this you know sort of weird choreography but at at times like it's it's like, hey, what are you doing? You know, let me show you. Or did you see this technique? Or you know, this is this thing that I discovered. And that that aspect of sharing, you know, I think is, was a part of that. And you know, I, that feels very similar. It doesn't feel very different. Yeah, yeah. I, like that. I I got out of art school. I had to find a job, and everybody was talking about web design. And I totally lied my way into a web design job. And the economy crashed. And you know, we had all this free time. I started to learn about ActionScript and. And that's how it was my entry point. It was sort of action script with Flash Four. You're programming in a box about this big, and and you know from there I just started to like kind of get super excited about different programming languages and hacking. And you know they sort of you would, you would use one system you hit a wall. You use another system you hit a wall. And I remember um, you know going from action script to Lingo, and then I was trying to program a neural network in Lingo, and it was too slow. And then I, you know, and then I took a Java class over the winter break when I was in, at, at school, and it was like, you know, I was so excited, it was so fast. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, I was making all these weird experiments, and somebody was like, "Oh, you have to talk to this professor Golan Levin." And so, you know, I met him, and then I went home, and I remember I emailed him these. Um, these PostScript experiments. So I was I was programming in PostScript, which is a beautiful, very odd, awkward language, and it's really like you can you can program 
graphics, I mean, it's a language of talking to printers. And I was making all of these copies of John Maida artworks where I was trying to reverse engineer the, the algorithms that John Maida was using to create his beautiful posters, but in PostScript. And I sent it to Golan, I think that really impressed him. And so we started to impress him. And so we started to c collaborate and, you know, once we were working together when I was a student, but when I graduated, we started to work together, you know, as a team. And um, my first summer, you know, out of school was going to Ars Electronica. So I like, I graduated and then I was on an airplane and I was in Linz and then I suddenly was immersed in, in a culture, you know, that I, I had only read about and I only, you know, known these people sort of virtually you know, just by sort of studying what they do, and then, you know, to go there and be part of that culture was really amazing. And I'm, uh, I'm super happy when, when I'm in with a group, when I'm working with people either that are, you know, s similar to me and that we can kind of jam about code things and, you know, r relate like on a, you know, on in terms of what we do and what, what our aesthetics are. And when you're working with somebody like that, it's, you know, it's great because you just, you can say one word and the other person knows what you're talking about. So with Golan, you know, we say, um, you know, we say something, and it's like it's immediate communication, and very high bandwidth. And and then alternatively, I really like working with people that have no idea what I'm doing, you know, and but are really interested in, you know, this what the kind of stuff that I can do, what the intersection with what they do. So you know, work with a magician and thinking about how you know m magic relates to this kind of um, you know real-time systems or working with a dancer or working with uh, um, singers or something like that and that that's really interesting the drawn so there's a performance that I made called drawn where I'm on stage I'm painting the audience can see what I'm painting behind me and um, it's a very slow project but it's it's also like it's very designed as a magic trick when it's designed as, as a way of sort of it's an illusion. The audience is seeing what I'm doing live, but there's some camera techniques that I can do that you know make make things happen. But it's also it's also exposed, right? I'm doing it in in, in plain view, so the audience can see what I'm doing, so they can also see the the way the trick is being performed, but they still still can enjoy it. But what I can go up the screen, and you know sometimes it doesn't work. Like sometimes I mess up. Sometimes for whatever reason it just doesn't look right. But when it works when it's working i feel like time slows down i feel like like you know there is there's a crazy energy that's produced between myself and the audience and the stuff that's happening and that like i don't i can't think of any other part of any project that does that 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 one does it and, and that or is it a means to an end no it's fucking boring it's really it's really boring i like i do like solving problems i do like um I like uh, I like there's something that happens when you're um, when you're programming a lot that you have almost there's almost things that you can do half asleep and you have there's certain patterns where you're like okay my brain there's like a muscle memory or like an algorithmic memory my brain like can take this idea this thing that I know I knew how to do when I was smarter and do it when I'm not so smart and that stuff I I like and I like um, you know I, I am really curious I am. You know, there is a side of me that like digs, you know, digs algorithms and digs like, you know, he, here's the approach that makes it faster. Here's the thing that you can do that solves this problem for, for sure. But actually coding itself is not, is not fun to watch. I mean, it's fun if you're with other people and you're coding together, that's fine. But just like it's, it is um, like any activity that where you're sitting in front of a computer, it's not, you know, it's not, um, it's not like a uh, you know easy to share. So, mm. there, so mm. there are times when I've really enjoyed coding when I'm you know in strange places. Like I'm on. I remember Theo and I during laser tag, we were um, you know on the sidewalk programming and like recompiling code and trying to get code to Evan and James to throw onto the you know and it's like like live you know and police are coming up and shutting us down Theo and I are closing our laptops and you know it's like and you know for sure there's a, a game designer named or game programmer named Notch who made Minecraft and he always does these live coding you know where he will code a game like in 24 hours and you can just watch him and and it's it is super interesting because you see all the sort of tricks and the the you know the methodologies and so on but for me i i 
the the art that I do, I really want it to be like have nothing to do with technology. Like I want, yeah, I would love people to look at the things and say like, wow, that's a beautiful idea. That's a beautiful expression. That's poetic. That's meaningful. That's resonant. That tells me about what it's like to be alive. That tells me about you know what it means to be human. And and you know, not that's a great piece of software. Not that's you know that's a dope algorithm. But really like. You know, beyond that, and so uh, for me, the the act of programming is not important, but the result is. Cool. Let's... But what what was beautiful, what I really love, is a few things. One is I saw him change careers when I was a kid. So you know, he started when I was eight. He took a workshop. He got really excited about. He's an English teacher. Took a workshop. Got excited about storytelling and said, you know, I want to do this professionally. And I saw him. You know, his first gig was at our public library, and he was so nervous that my mother had to keep cue cards, you know, with the names of the story, so he wouldn't forget what what he was doing. And I saw him start at that, like you know, the sort of free show in the library, just to friends. To you know, in, now he's part of a circuit, and then you know, performs in the national storytelling festivals, and has performed internationally, and he's like. He's accomplished, and that seeing that I think was really amazing. Like seeing, seeing a parent, seeing somebody older start something, and and really progress ha, has been amazing. And then the other thing is that you know, flat, the Flash community was really big at that point, and you know, you had there was a website which was a kind of private message board called Dreamless that Joshua Davis was running, and on that. On that site, there were, you know, that's how I found out about Casey Reese and, you know, Golan. The first time I read about him was on that site, and you know, there were net artists on that site, and people were hacking the board with JavaScript, and it was like this really weird kind of like nerd nerd art center, and and it did exist. I think what didn't exist were, you know, were the toolkits, and you know, for for example, processing. Like you, when when I was coming up, there was you know, just Java, straight Java. So you had to write your own rent. You had to write your own animation system. It took a lot, a lot of work. And you know, I learned a lot in those days. I learned a lot actually from you know, I I had to decompile applets. Like I had to download applets from Golan and John Maida and the people that I really liked because they were putting their applets online, but not necessarily their source code. And then I would download the the bytecode and decompile it and. Abuse my school's printer and print out stacks of code, and I would read code on the bus because I wanted to learn how how it worked. And so, when things like processing came around, you know that sort of publish default option of publishing with source code really changed things because you know you had a more advanced toolkit or a more you know more computationally heavy approach to working with media, where publishing was the default. Mm. So I, what I what I worry about is that you know a lot of times we're making these projects and it feels like we are doing tech demos. You know, like we're making projects and we're taking some piece of technology and it's like a demo, right? It's a it's a demo. It's interesting, but it's like a demonstration of what the technology can do. And what I what I want, what I hope, what I wish for is more poetry, less less demo. You know, that we are making. Uh, artistic works, works that are meaningful and resonant, and you know, personal, and you know, that go beyond, um, you know, go beyond the medium. So, Open Frameworks really began as a tool for students, and it was because I was teaching, and I had been working with another artist named Golan Levin, and Golan and I had been creating projects like performances and installations, and we were using. A library, a toolkit called ACU, which comes from MIT, and it, in some way, it's also that that's a precursor to processing. And we were using this toolkit. We were making projects, but it was really hard for me to share the work that I was making because the toolkit was not open source, and was also written for like SGI machines. It's kind of old school in a way. So Open Frameworks really sort of came about as a way of helping me show students the work. That I was making and helping them make similar kinds of projects, and and one of the things that you know I remember really vividly from that time, from those days, was kind of fighting with the administration in my department about 
programming, and especially you know something like C++, which was a very you know it's like a computer sciencey type type of language. And you know, I had arguments with them where they would say, you know, artists don't want to learn C++, and artists don't want to learn how to code. And but it was you know it was the way that I countered that argument was by you know create creating this tool or you know helping create this tool and working with students and the work that they were making was so amazing that you know within a year or two there was no argument anymore you know so we you know it's, we didn't have a mailing list i was like hand collecting emails and 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 writing emails to people in 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 uh you know sort of by hand saying that there's a new release and hand editing. We had like the documentation was one giant HTML page and just like doing doing all these things by hand. And, you know, we didn't know what, what it would become. We were just excited to put it out there. And there was this moment when I went to a festival and this artist had come from Japan and he, you know, he's like, I'm using open frameworks. And I had no idea. I and mean, I knew, you know, I knew our friends were using it and I knew people you know, who were using it, but I, to meet somebody, you know, from really far away, or like another time, I, um, as it's grown, and it's grown like really tr tremendously in terms of the number of people that are working with it and making stuff with it, um, we've had, you know, a, a division between the sort of core of open frameworks and add-ons, you know, with additional libraries, additional code, and that's been really good to sort of say, you know, this is something that we're responsible for, and this is something that People in the community are responsible for, and you know even further we've gone now to you know the the code of open frameworks has grown really tremendously you know in the last couple releases. So now we it, it's almost like too big for you know it used to be that Theo Arturo and I understood everything that that was in there, and you know the code has grown to a point where um, it makes sense to have kind of section leaders. So we've had people join up and say, you know, I want to be responsible for type or video or 3D or, what, you know, something that they're passionate about. And these are people that are, you know, the same way Theo Arturo and I, they're using op open frameworks on a daily basis for work and, you know, they really care deeply. So our, you know, one of the things that we've been really invested in is sort of distributing responsibility and, and, you know, distributing kind of how the development goes forward. Script and you know, that's how it was my entry point was sort of action script with flash four you're programming in a box about this big and and you know from there I just started to like kind of get it was super excited about different programming languages and hacking and you know they sort of you would, you would use one system you hit a wall you use another system you hit a wall and I remember um, you know, going from ActionScript to Lingo, and then I was trying to program a neural network in Lingo, and it was too slow. And then I, you know, and then I took a Java class over the winter break when I was in, uh, at school, and it was like, you know, I was so excited, it was so fast, and um, or something like that. And that that's really interesting because you were, you're, it's a, almost like trying to find this Venn diagrams of interests, and then those those intersections can be really large or they could be really small, but they're and those those intersections are really interesting, and the kind of sort of stuff that can come out of there is is great. Vision magic. And I still can enjoy it, but what I like is I end that performance with um, with a very very slow uh, stop motion animation sequence. So I'm sort of ripping up paper and crumpling paper, and I'm making this little piece of paper sort of go up the screen, sort of up to heaven, and it's it is. It's absolutely crazy slow. I mean, because I am like doing something and taking a loop and doing something and taking a loop and I'm trying not to mess up. I really like, at that moment, all I'm thinking about is I do not want them to see my hands. Like I just want them to see this paper crumple on its own and just go up the screen and go up the screen and go up the screen. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't work. Like sometimes I mess up, sometimes for whatever reason, it just doesn't look right, but when it, works when it's working i feel like time slows down i feel like like you know there is there's a crazy energy that's produced between myself and the audience and the stuff that's happening and that like i don't i can't think of any other part of any project that does that 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 one does it and, and that recommendation because i was teaching a course about drawing and code with uh Friend of mine named Taeyun, Taeyun Choi, who's just also an amazing artist, and he, like, for him, 
drawing is thinking and he just draws all the time. And so we taught this really weird class where, you know, I would teach coding exercises about drawing and Taeyun would teach drawing exercises about, about coding. And, you know, I would be like teaching like the gnarliest, nerdiest stuff and, you know, really just like deep into code and, and gesture. And he would take the students to another room and they would like have exercises where they were staring each other in the eye, you know, like really weird sort of performance, gestural, like about your body, about movement. And, and it was great. Like the interplay was really great. And we were looking for, you know, I, I am really curious. I am, you know, there is a side of me that like digs, you know, digs algorithms and digs like, you know, he, here's the approach that makes it faster. Here's the thing that you can do that solves this problem. For, for sure, but actually coding itself is not, is not fun to watch. I mean, it's fun if you're with other people and you're coding together, that's fine, but just like it's, it is um, like any activity that where you're sitting in front of a computer, it's not, you know, it's not, um, it's not like a, uh, you know, easy to share. So, mm -hmm. no, it's like that, there are really exciting times to be doing that stuff. And there are artists, you know, that do live coding where, where the act of coding is part of the pr process, you know, where that's the art, where you actually see the thinking, the, the experimenti experimenting. But, you know, I'm not, you know, I wouldn't want to watch somebody else code for, I mean, people do, I mean, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Wanna, wanna... Role models, for sure. I remember a Joshua Davis, like, you know, he was really, when, in 2000, he was doing things like putting his hard drive up for sale, you know, and just like he's just share everything that's on his hard drive. And it was like, you know, it's very flashy and he had a very flamboyant style, but there already was a, a, a kind of ethos of giving it away. Like, here's this thing that I made, I'm going to give it away, I'm going to show you, I'm going to reveal the secret. Not just that you can see the output, but you can see the process. And that, that, that did exist. I think what didn't exist, when things like processing came around, you know, that sort of publish default option of publishing with source code really changed things because, you know, you had a more advanced toolkit or a more, you know, more computationally heavy approach to working with media where publishing was the default. Hmm. So I, what, I, what I worry about is that, you know, a lot of times we're making these projects and it feels like we are doing tech demos. You know, like we're making projects and we're taking some piece of technology and it's like a demo, right? It's a, it's a demo. It's interesting, but it's like a demonstration of what the technology can do. And what I, what I want, what I hope, what I wish for is more poetry, less, less demo. You know, that we are.